Oh my goodness. Now we have a person to tell us that it's recording. Does everybody hear that, that voice? Recording in progress. I think Zoom has changed their privacy settings. I guess it's ethical so that you know, but of course nobody here is on film. Okay, so introducing Ajahn Bramali once again for the last session with him. Thank you. So, yeah, yeah. so, uh, uh, yeah, so we are looking at the uh, Anapanasati Sutta on mindfulness of breathing, which is the Buddha's main expansion of this particular meditation practice. So, it's very, <coughs> very interesting. And uh, this early on today, which was your morning and my afternoon, uh, we, or some of you, some of you probably had no idea what time it was for some of you, but anyway, whatever it was. <laughs> Uh, we had a look at the preliminaries for meditation practice, the idea of solitude, the idea of how to have your mind ready and the body as well. And uh, once the preliminaries are in place, and please remember that these preliminaries are in many ways some of the most important instructions here, because if you get those right, then the practice, as we saw before, is very much automatic. It doesn't require any much willpower or very much uh, doing on the part of the meditator. It mostly requires just the ability to just sit back and allow the process to happen. Uh, so this is what we find here as well. So once the mindfulness is established and it says, just mindful, they breathe in, mindful, they breathe out. And um, uh, as I uh, pointed out before, when you read the word of the Buddha, uh, uh, it's good to remember that when the Buddha speaks, he speaks with a very great degree of uh, uh, purpose. Yeah, his words are not chosen kind of randomly. He, he seems to be very deliberate in how he phrases things. Uh, so sometimes even individual words can have a meaning. It is possible we should not overstate the importance of individual words because uh, in history things may have changed a little bit, etc. As you would expect after two and a half thousand years of transmission. So it is not, we shouldn't overstate this, but sometimes it does. And in this particular case, you will notice that it were just there, yeah, just mindful, not mindful they breathe in, but just mindful they breathe in. And that word is also found in the Pali. This is a, a deliberate translation by uh, Bhante Sujato here to actually uh, incorporate the entire message of the Pali. And uh, so what is the point of this word? This little word in Pali is eva. What is the point? And the, uh, it, it seems if it means just, well, then presumably it means that all you have to do is to sit back, to be aware, to be mindful of what is going on. And you don't have to do anything deliberate. You don't have to uh, use any effort on your part. You don't have to, you can, all you have to do almost verbatim what it says here, it to be mindful and that's it. So this kind of, again, it reinforces the message that we have seen before in other suttas, whereby you don't use the willpower to make the meditation work. The meditation happens according to natural causes and conditions. And so your job is to sit back and allow the process to happen. If you have put the preliminary conditions into place, that mindfulness is there, then this is the outcome. All you have to do is to be aware of the process itself. So I don't know, maybe that is over-interpreting the text. It could be over-interpreting it, but uh, it is still interesting that, that the word is actually found there. So now we come to the first of four tetrads. So 16 steps in all, four, four times four. And the first of these four tetrads is equivalent to the body contemplation of the Satipatthana Sutta. Yeah, that is called Kaya Anupasana. Kaya is body, Anupasana is like uh, seeing along with, yeah, contemplating if you like it. So contemplation of the body. Um, yeah, body here is used in a very broad sense to meet any, to mean really any any kind of a conglomeration of phenomena, any group of phenomena which kind of belong together. And the breath is like a group of uh, phenomena, yeah, where all the various phenomena, they kind of like group together, this kind of breath, that kind of breath, all the breath phenomena 
uh, is one thing. That's why the breath is called the body in this case, and this is specifically said in this sutta here. So this is what the Buddha says yeah, about the, uh, this part of the Anapanasati here. When breathing in heavily, they know I am breathing in heavily. When breathing out heavily, they know I am breathing out heavily. When breathing in lightly, they know I am breathing in lightly. When breathing out lightly, they know I am breathing out lightly. They practice breathing in experiencing the whole body. They practice breathing out experiencing the whole body. They practice breathing in stilling the body's motion. They practice breathing out stilling the body's motion. So these are the first four steps. And uh, the, some of the translations here will be different from maybe what you are used to if you haven't read these translations before. Uh, but it starts out with just uh, noticing the breath. Yeah, is it a long breath or a short breath? Uh, here translated as a heavy or light breath, uh, same basic idea. Yeah, is it long or is it short? It just means that you have a very basic and straight away, a kind of immediate awareness of the breath. It's not very detailed yet, you don't know the breath in all its uh, uh, kind of, um, in all its details, etc. But you are aware of the general sense of the breath, what it is like. Uh, and it starts off with a heavy breath, <coughs> or the long breath. And um, you may have noticed that as you kind of calm down, you become more peaceful, the required for oxygen, of the body is probably less, yes, yeah, the breath becomes more shallow, yeah, becomes lighter or shorter, however you want to say it. This is kind of maybe the very beginning of this breath meditation. When you sit down, the breathing may be quite long and heavy because of whatever reasons. And it starts to kind of calm down, yeah. And at this point, it's just called knowing. Yeah? It is just the knowledge because you are, mindfulness is already established, so you know this without any need for practice. The next step, when they're talking about experiencing the whole body, here they say you practice in this way. Yeah, first you know, and now you practice. And uh, the point here, I don't know what exactly what the point is, uh, but the point, my guess is that the point is that it takes time for you to be able to experience the whole body. Uh, yeah, or the whole body of the breath or whatever it is. Uh, it takes time because this is an expansion of the awareness. It takes the ability to sit back and be aware, just to be mindful, to allow the mindfulness to develop. And as the mindfulness develops, then you have the ability to expand the awareness, to incorporate the breath in its entirety. You see all the details, the beginning, the middle, the end. You, you see the varieties of breath. You see more about how it feels on, you know, in the body, wherever it is that you are experiencing it, and you ex you're expand. So it takes time. Practice here uh, does not mean, there's no, no indication anywhere that it means that you have to do something deliberate. It's just that you have to be patient. You have to wait for this to happen. That is why it's called practice, I say. This is my interpretation, but it kind of fits with how the uh, suttas in general speak about meditation practice, how we have seen it so far. And then there's the interesting point here about experiencing the whole Body. What does that mean? And uh, on the surface of it, uh, it might sound as this means the whole physical body, samba kaya patisangvedi, experiencing the whole body. Um, and it is often interpreted like that. There are many meditation systems where they say that you first of all you experience the breath, then you go to experiencing the whole physical body, the sensations, and all of that. Uh, it's quite a common way of interpreting this. Uh, but uh, to me, the most the far more obvious way of interpreting this is here to understand the body as the breath. Yeah. And the, the Anapanasati Sutta itself, it specifically says later on that the breath is a body. That's why this is called body contemplation. So it seems to be implied by the Sutta itself that we're here dealing with the, with the breath and not with the physical body. The commentary also interprets in that, that way. We are dealing with breath meditation, not with body meditations. That 
also seems to imply that. So everything, in my opinion, anyway, seems to point towards a breath rather than body. And uh, you might wonder, does it really matter? Uh, what does it, how much does it matter one way or the other? And uh, the answer is that maybe it doesn't matter so much uh, because what uh, the overall, what matters here is the overall progress of meditation. We come back to the breath later on. Uh, so as long as you come back to the breath again, uh, as long as your mind is developing in mindfulness, as long as you're able to carry on the meditation, the exact interpretation may not be so important. So sometimes, you know, we can argue about these tiny things and we can end up with <laughs> damaging our progress because arguing often ends up being a bit heated and then we get a bit upset or whatever. And of course, then you damage the meditation rather than improving it. So sometimes we just have to shrug our shoulders and say, actually, maybe it doesn't matter all that much. But uh, in the end, I think the, this means experiencing the whole breath and in that, I'm also following what uh, uh, Ajahn Brahm, how he teaches this, uh, uh, because that seems to be the natural thing here. Uh, and then uh, you carry on your practice, uh, and the next part is then breathing in, stilling. His, uh, he has here the body's motion, the kaya sankara. And uh, the body's motion, kaya sankara, is defined in the sutta specifically to mean the breath. Yeah, it is said to be so elsewhere. So what we are really talking about here is stilling the breath. And when the body becomes peaceful uh, at this point, already at this point, a lot of the body is fading into the background already. Your main focus is the breath, and that is the motion that we are talking about. So you can start here to see the factors. Yeah, I mentioned before that the two things that you have to look out for in meditation practice, the two things things that tell you whether you are uh, moving in the right direction or not. Uh, the two things are the degree of happiness that you have uh, and the degree of peace and stillness that you have. Uh, and here we can already see this idea of peace and stillness uh, yeah, being part of this, uh, uh, even the very first uh, tetrad of the, the Anapanasati Sutta. You're calming down, you're becoming more peaceful, your awareness is expanding, the mindfulness becomes stronger. You may already be feeling some kind of gladness, yeah, feeling kind of light and buoyant inside uh, because things are becoming already quite beautiful, in fact, uh, at this point. So this is then equivalent to the body contemplation, the Kaya Nupassana. Then we come to the second of these four tetrads, and the second one is equivalent to the uh, Vedana Vipassana, the contemplation of feelings, yeah, or the contemplation of sensations in the Satipatthana Sutta. And now it starts to get really exciting. Yeah, now it gets very interesting. And this is how the contemplation of feeling is described in this particular sutta. They practice breathing in, experiencing rapture. They practice breathing out, experiencing rapture. They practice breathing in, experiencing bliss. They practice breathing out, experiencing bliss. Bliss. They practice breathing in, experiencing these emotions. They practice breathing out, experiencing these emotions. They practice breathing in, stilling these emotions. They practice breathing out, stilling these emotions. So here we are dealing with happiness, yeah, all the way throughout, starting with the rapture, which can be quite coarse and gross as you start out. And then as the uh, meditation develops, you go from rapture to bliss. And the difference between the two is just that bliss is a bit more refined. It is is more peaceful, more subtle, it is more powerful, and it is a better, higher experience of, uh, of happiness. Yeah, we discussed this before. This is the distinction between piti on the one hand and sukha on the other hand. It's just, a, it's just a way of describing that the process of happiness is evolving and becoming better and better as the practice goes on. And um, then uh, as you practice this, and you will notice all the way you have the idea of practicing, but again, we have to follow the general outline of meditation we're talking about before, that there is no willpower involved here. You are standing back, you're just seeing this happen. 
yeah, it's kind of amazing just to see these things happen. It's as if you've got nothing to do with you. It's as if nature is taking over. Nature is just full of bliss and happiness. This is what happens in nature if you allow things to be here. It's kind of this almost miraculous and astonishing development of the mind who happens almost automatically here. And then you have the next one, which is the practice, the breathing in, experiencing these emotions. Uh, this is, um, uh, I'm not sure what this is in Pali anymore. I've lost the Pali now behind this. Um, let, me, let me just look that up because I, it's kind of important to have that I think, yeah, so we know what we're talking about. Otherwise, we're kind of fumbling around in the dark unless we know what the Pali behind these terms is. I'm supposed to know this, but uh, sometimes your mind just doesn't want to bring it up. So, um, yeah, so yeah, oh, it's Chitta Sankara. Okay, yeah. So chitta sankara is the um, like the uh, activities of the mind, yeah, or the uh, and that is uh, defined in the suttas as, as feelings and perceptions, yeah, vedana and sankaras. So this is kind of the the basic feeling of the mind, the basic outlook of the mind at this particular point. Uh, yeah, you will notice it's nothing to do with uh, will or anything like that. The body is not really mentioned. Uh, what is left at this point is really just feelings and perceptions. And the main perception you have is the perception of bliss. Perhaps a little bit of perception of the breath is probably still there, a little bit in the background but by now. But uh, so these things are all kind of this is what is taking over the mind. It's becoming very, very beautiful at this particular point. You may ask, how is this different from Piti and Sukha? And I don't think it is very different. It's just the kind of gradual development of these feelings. And they have given here slightly different names. And uh, one of the reasons why it uses the term Chitta Sankara is because in the next one, here, the next step, you breathe in stilling the emotions. Yeah? Chitta Sankara Patisam Vedi. No, Chitta Sankara or something like that. You're stilling it and you are calming down these particular emotions. So again, you can see here the movement of the mind, the other movement, the change in the, uh, the, in the idea of meditation practice. It's all about happiness. Yeah. One level of happiness after the other. And then in the very last step, it's again about calming things down, making things even more subtle, even more peaceful. The two qualities of mind that you can measure your meditation by the degree of bliss that you have and the degree of tranquility and calm that you have as this process progresses inside of you. This is your personal experience of these things. Now there's a couple of things about this passage that is very interesting. Very often when we talk in Buddhism about understanding feelings, yeah, the the Vedana Nupasana, this comes from the Satipatthana Sutta, very often it talks about understanding all kinds of feelings, about uh, Dukkha, Vedana, the painful feelings, uh, the uh, worldly feelings, the uh, Samisa Vedana, I think it is called there. And uh, so it talks about a very broad spectrum of feelings. Uh, yeah? But here, if you look at this one here, all it talks about is the positive feelings. Uh, Nothing but positive feeling, nothing but happiness and bliss. So the implication is that you don't actually have to contemplate the painful feelings at all. You can all you have to do is contemplate this, contemplate the happy feelings, and that fulfills it, the entire Vedana Vipassana part of the Satipatthana Sutta. <coughs> That's kind of astonishing, isn't it? So no need to go into the pain. As long as you have the spiritual happy feelings, those spiritual happy feelings actually they transcend the pain and they go beyond that. And you don't have to worry about the painful things. And part of the reason is because the painful feelings, the best way to get insight into anything is by its absence. If something is no longer there, that is 
is when you get the real insight into something. And because you know it has ceased, it means you understand its impermanence, you obviously understand its pain, and you don't actually need to stay with painful feelings to understand them. Isn't that great? Yeah, chuck out the painful feelings, bring on the happy feelings, and just stay with the happy feelings. Kind of marvelous, isn't it? <laughs> and I, you know, and the, so I think that people who spend a lot of time contemplating pain in the body, I think it's not really required. I think you can bypass that whole thing, and I think you'll be perfectly fine. That you just go straight to the happiness, as long as it is the right kind of happiness. It can't be indulgence. That's not going to work. But it has to be, but if it is the spiritual happy feelings, then it is going to do the trick and you can bypass the whole thing. Yeah. That is the first thing which is kind of really fascinating about this. The other thing which is important here is how do we move from the Kaya Vipassana, the initial four uh, observations of the breath, to the Vedana Vipassana, where we are contemplating feelings. Uh, and there's like a like a kind of a, a bit of a, um, a transformation there in how we are experiencing the world, uh, moving towards feelings, moving a little bit away from the physical breath. Uh, so how does that transformation happen? And this is where sometimes uh, the required, you require some sort of contemplation, yeah, some sort of uh, change in perception, some sort of nudging of the mind. Uh, to remind yourself that you are living well, to contemplate very briefly your, uh, the way you live, to remind yourself that you have the Buddha as your teacher, uh, to have a tiny bit of metta towards the breath, yeah? Any of these things, in the sense of gratitude for what you have, uh, any of these things that can lift the mind up a little bit, uh, make it more bright, uh, and then that movement from the ordinary breath uh, to the more powerful breath, which has bliss with it, uh, can then happen through that. Uh, it doesn't have to be not like that. Uh, sometimes that this uh, transition is automatic. Uh, yeah, it just happens as a matter of course because uh, uh, your, you know, all the factors are already in place. So it kind of moves from the breath uh, into the happiness, onto the bliss, like a seamless transition from one to the other. Uh, that is the ideal way for this to happen. Uh, but things don't always happen according to the ideal way. Sometimes you have to kind of nudge it a little bit to help it moving forward a little bit. And that is what sometimes is required in these transitions when you move from one Satipatthana to uh, the other one. So that is the Vedana Vipassana, the second of these uh, tetrads uh, in the Anapana Sati Sutta. Um, then we come to the third tetrad. Uh, the third tetrad is then equivalent to the citta nupassana in the Satipatthana Sutta. Citta means mind. This then is the contemplation of the mind. Yeah, and uh, uh, this is how it is then explained here in the Anapanasati Sutta. They practice breathing in, experiencing the mind. They practice breathing out, experiencing the mind. They practice breathing in, gladdening the mind. They practice breathing out, gladdening the mind. They practice breathing in, stilling the mind. They practice breathing out, stilling the mind. They practice breathing in, freeing the mind. They practice breathing out, freeing the mind. This is the contemplation of the mind, the chitta vipassana. And um, I now things are getting very refined. Yeah, I'm going to talk in a second about the idea what it means to experience the mind. But uh, both in the previous tetrad, when we're looking at the feelings, and also now when it comes to the mind, the breath is becoming more and more in the background. Yeah, it's kind of fading into the background. But it may, it is still there, yeah, it is, and if you turn your attention to it, you will probably be able to still experience the breath, but it's kind of fading more and more into the background. So the breath is still a kind of like a, an anchor, if you like, it is still the thing that you may use to develop this, but the other things are starting to take over more and more. First the feelings, and now the mind. So what does it mean to experience the mind. 
And uh, uh, to answer this question, you have to imagine what things are not the mind, yeah? And the things that are not the mind is really the five senses and the body, yeah? The things that look outward into the world, that is what is not the mind. So to experience the mind, you have to give up those things that are not mind, and then the mind will come into focus. So as you are withdrawing into yourself, you are going more inside, you are letting go of the five senses and the body, and what remains is really the mental experience of reality. And very often that mental experience of reality will manifest as a bright light in the mind. Yeah? The moon, the sun, the stars uh, uh, it can, become, can be in very large degrees of different intensities and, and uh, shapes, if you like. Uh, and uh, so, but it is a, but a common denominator is that it is a light kind of in the mind. Yeah, this is often how it is experienced. And um, this is also described, it's not described in this particular sutta here, but it's described in other suttas uh, where the Buddha specifically talks about the obasa. And the obasa is like a brilliance or a light in the mind. Uh, and it talks about the rupa, the rupa is a form. Yeah, so it's like a, for, a shape to this light, uh, and there is a brilliance to it. Uh, and this is very often how this is experienced, uh, perhaps always, but certainly, uh, certainly very often. Uh. Um, so this is then the mind coming into focus. Yeah? And then as you then keep on practicing in this way, uh, and remember that here there is nothing really that you have to do. Yeah? All you have to do is kind of get out of the way, uh, stand back to the best of your ability, allow the process to carry on. Uh, and in fact, Ideally, what happens as you go through this process, you stand back more and more. You are less and less involved in the process as it happens. This is the ideal way of doing this kind of practice. It's as if you understand how to be less and less controlling, letting go of the will to deeper and deeper degrees. Yeah? This is kind of what you start to uncover as you do this. You can see the will kind of getting in the way. And one way that you can see the will at this particular point is in the movement of that mind, the movement in the object of the mind. If the move, there's movement there, you know the will is still involved. So then you can almost like experiment a little bit. Are things calming down or are they getting more restless? And then you know what's happening in the mind. And then you continue just standing back, allowing things to be. The next step here is that gladdening the mind. And uh, so in other words, you are adding even more bliss to what you're experiencing already. You may, you know, this idea is kind of astonishing that you still can experience more bliss, right? Every step here is kind of increasing the bliss, increasing the happiness. We've already seen rapture, then we have seen bliss, then we have seen these emotions and stilling these emotions. Now you're going to gladden the mind. It's as if there is no end to the amount of bliss and happiness you can experience. It's kind of astonishing, this, this Buddhist path. And uh, it's hard to, you know, when you see this, it's, it's just so attractive. It's just so utterly interesting. I'm always surprised why the whole world isn't Buddhist. Everyone should be a Buddhist when you read these kind of things. Maybe we are just bad at marketing ourselves. Maybe we need to kind of get these ideas out there more, yeah? Because this is just, uh, I don't know, there's something extraordinarily attractive with this kind of teaching. So you gladden the mind. And of course, the way you gladden the mind is again the same thing as we're talking about before. We gladden the mind through just allowing it to be here. Yeah? And by putting the attention in the right place. So here you are focusing on stability. You're focusing on the bliss that is, that is there. If there is this beautiful nimitta or light in the mind, uh, your attention is on that. Uh, you attend kind of centrally on this object. Uh, and by being still, by not doing anything, allowing the process to happen, the gladness just keeps on rising, becoming more and more powerful, more and more blissful. Now. And then the next part of this is then to still it even more. You practice breathing and stilling the mind, yeah? Even more stillness. So again, you're allowing this whole thing to calm down even more, focusing on the center of the object, not on the movement. And as you do that, it calms down even more happiness and tranquility, yeah, developing hand in hand, becoming more and more powerful uh, as you go along. Yeah? 
then eventually you come to the point where you breathe in freeing the mind. And uh, again, you know, at this point you can't do anything. At this point it is as if you are getting very close to being stuck in what is going on. Uh, and now when it talks about freeing the mind, the Mocha Chitan, it certainly has nothing that you are doing it gets a standing back and allowing the mind almost to free itself and the mind reaches this freedom all through its own devices you all you have to do is focus on the happiness and the bliss allow that to develop and then you, the mind wants to go towards that freedom and then it happens what is that freedom and that freedom because the wording here is the more chayang it's very closely related to the idea of Vimutti, and Vimutti is related to the ideas of the jhana states. So here we're talking about samadhi, the jhanas, and all of that. Yeah, the mind is freed. What is it freed from? It is freed from the five senses. So now the mind is completely immersed in itself, and it's also freed from the five hindrances and the remaining defilements of the mind. And the mind is liberated, go, go into a very profound degree of freedom. So um, um, this is uh, the idea, this is what is going on here. This is how eventually you reach Samadhi. The bliss towards the end is so profound and so extraordinarily attractive. You can't really stop yourself. You really want to, you just want to be here, you don't want to be anywhere else in the world. And then eventually you learn to let go enough uh, to allow the mind to kind of fall into the samadhi and to be released from all the things around it. Uh, and then you enter a state of samadhi. Uh. Of course, it can be tricky. Uh. It is not easy at this point of the path. It's not difficult either. It just takes experience. Uh, yeah, Because what you are doing at this point of the path, where you are freeing the mind, uh, is that you're letting go of the entire five sense world. Uh, to the point where you can no longer access the five senses. It means that you are almost like you're dying to the five senses. If you can't access them anymore, it means they're gone. It's as if you are allowing yourself to become permanently blind, yeah, or not hearing. It's that you're, it doesn't matter, you don't care about those things anymore. Right? And of course, that requires that you have no attachment to these things. Any attachment to the five senses is going to block you at this point from enabling you to actually enter these states. So this is why the contemplation of the sensory world, the contemplation of the five senses, their unsatisfactoriness, the problems in that world, why it matters so much. Yeah? The contemplation of the body perhaps as well, why it really matters because it will eventually enable you to make this leap and then that confidence and then entering this uh, strange world, this very different world of Samadhi. So, again, we are seeing here that you need to move from uh, one of the things here, you have to go from the second tetrad of the feelings and the emotions of the mind, the Vedana Nupasana, and you have to move from there to the Chitta Nupasana, the contemplation of the mind, yeah, and moving from one to the, uh, to the other one. And uh, so, that again, there is a bit of a kind of a Transition here, transi transitioning from the feelings to the mind itself. And again, that is not a transition, can be difficult. Yeah, this is where kind of difficulties can happen. So, how can we help that transition? And uh, one thing to remember is to all of these, in all of these cases, is to go slowly, not to go too fast, to make sure that the previous stage is really well established. And yeah, you don't move on too fast to the next stage. Only when the kind of the mind becomes very apparent and very strong, you get strong nimittas, stable nimittas, and then you kind of move on to the next stage. Um, to the, the right thing here to contemplate here, if you want to move from one to the other one is that because you're moving into the world of the mind, then here again, to um, help that, uh, again, it is important to be able to let go of the senses and the body. Yeah? Here, attachment to the senses and the body can be the sort of thing that stops you from going forward, because the senses and the body are fading into the background. It's as if you are gradually losing them. So just a reminder of the impermanence of the world. It's just like a perception very gentle nudge of the mind. You don't want to contemplate a lot at this stage because you will destroy the whole meditation. 
It's just a very gentle reminder of the problems of all of those things. So let them go, and then the mind will kind of gradually, uh, by itself, lead towards the uh, purely mental experience that, that comes in the chitta vipassana. So this then is this remarkable detailed um, description of how the mindfulness of breathing happens. Yes, stage by stage. Uh, it is all just bliss, it is all just tranquility. More, more bliss upon bliss upon bliss, tranquility upon tranquility upon tranquility, uh, until eventually you go all the way to the jhana states. And now we come to the very last part of the Anapanasati Sutta. This is equivalent to the Dhamma Nupassana in the Satipatthana Sutta. This is all about uh, uh, the contemplation of uh, principles or Dhamma qualities, uh, yeah, etc. And uh, the main idea, one of the reasons to, to call this contemplation of principles, uh, that it has now been moving into the area of understanding cause and effects, more into the insight, insight of things. We have come to the end, really, of the calming of the mind. And now, when we come out of our meditation, we end the calming of the mind. Now is the time to contemplate what has been happening. So this is how this last contemplation reads in the Anapanasati Sutta. The practice breathing in, observing impermanence. The practice breathing out, observing impermanence. The practice breathing in, observing fading away. The practice breathing out, observing fading away. The practice breathing in, observing cessation. The practice breathing out, observing cessation. The practice breathing in, observing, letting go. The practice breathing out, observing, letting go. And uh, the words, Pali words that are used here are very similar to what we saw before with the awakening factors. Yeah, the fading away, viraga, the cessation, which is the viroda. And then we have the last one here is Pati Nisiga, which also is found in that, uh, the other one, was, no, I think it's Vosanga is found in that one, but Pati Nisiga and Vosanga are very closely related to each other. Yeah, so you can see here how this, how, again, there is such integrity in these things, how they're all referring to each other in different ways. <coughs> they're all kind of using the same vocabulary, but it's slightly different contexts. So, so what is this all about? Uh, and what this is about is a contemplation of various stages of impermanence, yeah, anicca in various degrees. So first of all, you just have plain old impermanence, yeah, good old impermanence, things coming, things passing away, coming up, going down, things changing all the time, going from this, going that, breath going in, breath going out, bliss coming, bliss going away. This is just plain impermanence, just the changeability of the world. Yeah? And then, but a more profound aspect of impermanence is fading away, because fading away is not just things being impermanence, but impermanence having a particular direction, yeah? a direction in the sense of things going somewhere, going towards fading away, moving towards eventually towards cessation. Yeah, so fading away is a particular, particular kind of impermanence, uh, moving towards a particular state. And that thing that it is moving towards uh, is cessation. Yeah? It fades away, well, fading away, tending to its, uh, uh, to its uh, uh, logical conclusion, is cessation, things coming to an end. And uh, so here, this gradual, yeah, this increasing degrees of impermanence and you contemplate all of these and each one of these has the ability to give a deepening appreciation of what impermanence actually is about and then the final stage of impermanence observing letting go well this is the conclusion of all impermanence this is the point whereby you understand impermanence so deeply especially through seeing the cessation of things that craving itself is destroyed and when craving itself stops because uh, there's no point in craving things that are inherently problematic, yeah, well, that is where, where the path itself comes to an end. Yeah? This is the very last step. This is where you actually become an arahant there at the very end there. 
So how does this work in practice? It sounds maybe very theoretical. How does this actually work? What are we observing as impermanent? What are we observing as fading away and ceasing? And of course, the thing, the obvious thing that we are observing here is the whole process of calming that we have just been through. Yeah, we have just been through this amazing process beforehand. And you may not always get through the whole process, but maybe very rarely even go through the whole process. Maybe you only get to the first four uh, stages, maybe you get to the first eight or first six or whatever. But regardless of how far you get in the sequence, you can use that as a foundation for understanding, for having some more insight into what is going on there. So we look back on this process, yeah? And as we look back on the process, that is where these insights happen there. So what exactly is this process? Well, this process really is just our experience, yeah? It's our experience, we experience this, this is a first person experience, this is how we experience the meditation progress, yeah? Happiness and all of these kinds of things. And uh, because uh, uh, it is our experience, uh, this whole process really is the process of the five khandhas. Uh, and the five personality factors that we talk about in Buddhism so often, uh, the rupa khanda, the form, the vedana, the sannya, the sankara, and the vinyana, yeah? the form, feelings, perceptions, uh, the will, and consciousness. Uh, well, that is what we are seeing in this process, and we are seeing the gradual transformation of these five khandhas through this process. So when we are contemplating this at the very end, what we are contemplating is actually the five khandhas. Yeah, isn't that? I think that's quite interesting. I, it's always been one of the things that I have noticed whenever uh, we do uh, you know, retreats, uh, is the question, well, what are these five khandhas? It's a very common question to get. And then you can sort of talk about these five khandhas in great detail, the rupas and the body, and fine material rupa, you can talk about Vedana and its various manifestations and, and all of these kind of things, and you can explain what it is. And then at the end of a long explanation, half an hour's explanation, people say, all right, but what are the five khandhas? <laughs> and the, the reason why it is so hard is because even though you may give a theoretical explanation, you can kind of understand what it is. And what we really want to do is to have an experiential understanding of these things. What are these things in experience? That's where they become real. All the intellectualization doesn't really cut much ice in terms of the spiritual practice. So this is why it is so important to understand that actually all our experiences are five khandhas. And when we are meditating, we can see the change in the five khandhas directly. And we can start to understand and uncover them. The whole purpose of the path of meditation is ultimately to understand these five khandhas in terms of the three characteristics, yeah? To understand them in terms of impermanence, uh, suffering and non-self. And this is what we're doing right here. The focus here is on impermanence, but the ideas of suffering and non-self come along with that. Uh, so how, how does this work? So obviously, yeah, uh, if we're talking here about the uh, physical body and the breath, uh, then very clearly as you go through this process, the breath and the physical body is gradually fading away. Uh, you feel the physical body less and less, you are less aware of what is going on. Uh, the breath is gradually fading away. Yeah? So initially you can see it's impermanence, maybe you can see some pains coming and going in the body. Yeah? If you see too much pain, then you may change your posture, but you will maybe see a little bit. Uh, so you can feel the body in that sense, or you can see the body. Uh, uh, but gradually the body kind of goes away, and your perception of the reality of the body is kind of disappearing. Yeah? Fading away, fading away, fading away, until eventually the body is completely gone. Uh, when you, when you reach the last stage of calming the mind, yeah, the Vimochayam Chitta, freeing the mind, the body is completely gone. So that is one example. This is the Rupa Kanda. Then you have the five senses. The five senses is the same. Yeah? As you close your eyes, most of the world of sight is gone. Maybe you can see some light through your eyelids, but eventually the sight turns off. Yeah? Taste and smell are kind of gone already a long time ago. When your body fades away, it means that your sense of touch is also disappearing. Yeah? And then maybe 
the last sense to turn off is usually the hearing sense. Yeah, you can still hear things even when you go quite deep in your meditation. Yeah? But eventually that too fades away, disappears when you enter a jhana state. The, the senses are fading away, first of all impermanent, then fading away and eventually coming to complete cessation. They're completely gone. And um, so these are two examples, right? And, and so what happens when you contemplate that? Well, what happens is that you see that, first of all, you see that they are really, really impermanent because when something ceases and is completely gone, well, you have proven once for all that it is absolutely impermanent. It can be completely gone. You are still there. Impermanence is like absolute. But the other thing that you notice, and this is kind of intuitive, you don't have to really look for these things. It's so obvious when it happens. And the other thing that you see is that these things are suffering. Five senses are gone. The body is gone. And you, you feel liberated. You feel freed from an oppression. You feel that, wow, this is just marvelous. Yeah? And then you understand the suffering nature of these things. For the first time in your life, when you go into a jhana state, you have elevated yourself up on that mountaintop. You have lifted yourself up and you're seeing the landscape beneath. And for the first time, you understand it is all a big load of suffering. It's a burden. And this is a powerful insight that comes with samadhi. It is so important to understand that uh, the idea that somehow you can separate insight from samadhi, that these two things are completely different things, uh, is just a misunderstanding of how this works. Uh, because by achieving a state of samadhi, by definition, you will understand the inferiority of the sensory world. Yeah, because you have a direct comparison. You can't help to notice these things. It is good to contemplate it a bit extra to kind of make that insight very clear. So you add a bit of extra contemplation. Nevertheless, it's going to be immediately in your face obvious. So insight and samadhi go hand in hand. They are not separate things. That's why you find that beautiful verse in the Dhammapada that says that uh, for someone who has wisdom, uh, yeah, or someone without wisdom, they don't have a jhana, and without jhana, you don't have wisdom. But when you have both, you are in the presence of nibbana. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Anyway, I can't remember the how exactly how the palm goes. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So, yeah, this is how it works, and that, but it's not just the uh, the body or the senses that this happens to, it is also all the other aspects of the five khandas, the body and the senses is just really the first khanda, the rupa khanda, but the same thing happens to the vedana khanda, the feelings, yeah? The feelings, initially you still have some pain in the body, yeah, yeah occasionally, and it's just unavoidable, that's the nature of the body to be painful. And but as the meditation progresses, there is less and less pain, the pain is fading into the background. And the bliss starts to take over, yeah? And then when the bliss starts to take over, the problems in the body are almost completely gone. It's very hard to notice them because the bliss is so, uh, takes over the whole experience. So it is as if you can see certain feelings fading away and disappearing. Pain is coming to a, a complete cessation at a certain point. And then the happy feelings themselves start to transform. They become more and more happy, yeah? They become more and more powerful. This is the impermanence of happy feeling, yeah? moving towards kind of the fulfillment in the jhana states. So you see the impermanence of certain feelings, they're fading away in cessation of certain feelings. And as you do that, you, when you come out, you apply the same kind of logic, and you will see that all the worldly happiness that you have let go, let go of already, because all you are left with at this point is the spiritual happiness, all the worldly happiness is inferior now. And you understand the samisa sukha that you are taught to contemplate in the Satipatthana Sutta, you can reject all that because it is inferior to the happiness you have now. Pain, there's no need to contemplate pain too much, that pain is inferior, it's bleeding obvious that pain is inferior. So, okay, you check out the pain, yeah, that is uh, in, impermanent uh, and it's dukkha. And uh, one of the things that I didn't mention before, which also comes out of this, uh, is of course the idea of not self. Because when you enter a state of samadhi, you cannot no longer 
and you can no longer access these things, the body of the senses will no longer being able to access things by definition means that it is non self. Having access to things, being able to control them, that is the meaning of a self, yeah, in regard to these things. So you also understand the non self nature as well. So all the three characteristics come together body, then the feelings, perception, the same thing. Yeah, your perceptions are changing as you go through this. Perceptions, you no longer have any, you lose your perceptions of the external world, the external world is fading away, perception of the mind is becoming stronger instead, the worldly perceptions are fading away, yeah. you see them ceasing eventually, yeah. and then you have the same kind of insight with perceptions too. Yeah. Then you have the will, yeah, it's a very, another very important factor here, and uh, uh, the will as things are calming down and becoming more peaceful, yeah. It is obviously that the will, the doing aspect of the mind, the creative force in the mind, that, that too is gradually fading away and ceasing. Yeah, yeah Sankaras, uh, the fourth of these five khandhas, uh, is gradually disappearing completely. Yeah. And uh, so that gradual cessation, and then you enter the jhana state, especially the second jhana, and then the Sankara, khanda, the will is completely gone. And that again is something, these things are, when you see this kind of stuff, it gets extraordinarily powerful, yeah? Because uh, when it comes to the sankara, the will disappearing, then actually there is something which is very, very close to our heart. The idea of me being the agent in my life. For the first time, we start to realize that this too actually has nothing to do with you because you kind of abandon it altogether to the point of not having access to it, and you are still there. And actually you're more happy than you were before. You realize the will was actually a bit of a tyrant. The will was a burden. All this movement of the mind just makes you restless, it makes you tired, but letting go of that makes you feel even more peaceful, even more happy. So you let go of the will, and things are even better. Yeah, you understand the non-self nature of the will. So all of this is the contemplation of the five khandhas. The last one is the consciousness khanda. And uh, again, as you go through this process, uh, you're letting go of large parts of what we call consciousness. Uh, when you let go of the five senses, it means that five of the six kinds of consciousness are gone. Then as you enter the jhana states, yeah, uh, deeper and deeper, uh, you can see aspects of mind consciousness too, uh, gradually being let go of. Uh, yeah? and then you start to understand the impermanence, the uh, uh, suffering even of consciousness, because as you let go of this, uh, you're feeling better and better, more and more together. Yeah. So this is how this process works, and um, it's it's all it's just natural, very very natural process. You know, it, there's not that much you have to do, yeah, because uh, it's kind of staring you in the face uh, when you do these things. Uh, at the earlier stages, it's a bit more difficult because uh, you are only seeing partial cessation, partial fading away. But even if you do a little bit of meditation, yeah, and you kind of get a little bit of peace, or say an intermediate peace, a little bit of happiness, you can still do this kind of contemplation to just to remind yourself yeah, where real happiness is to be found, where you, why this path really is worthwhile, then you are on the right track. Yeah. So that is the Dhamma Nupassana, yeah, the last, the very last, the Tetrad or the Anapanasati Sutta. It is equivalent to what we find, uh, which is the contemplation of the five hindrances and the seven Bojangas uh, in the uh, Anapan, in the, the uh, Satipatthana Sutta. Uh, because in that Sutta, you are contemplating causality, understanding the basis for these things. Yeah. So one of the things that we also should also be contemplating here, maybe even which I haven't really mentioned, is the five hindrances, yeah? understanding the five hindrances, uh, seeing how they fade away, seeing how they come to a complete cessation, understanding the relationship between the five hindrances and the mind in Samadhi, and why, uh, you know, understanding also some of the causality, what drives these five hindrances, uh, and then get, gain an understanding how to give them up, but how to and leave them out of your mental life altogether, ultimately. And then you are getting some very useful insights right there. 
So that is the um, basic idea. And eventually, as you do this, you start to see that all of these things that you are looking at, that they are all problematic. They all have an aspect of suffering to them. Yeah. And then eventually, craving comes to an end. Why? Because you can't crave for suffering. Suffering is not interesting. And you just leave everything to one side. Craving comes to an end. And then you have reached the very very last stage, which is the observance of the letting go, the Padanisaga uh, Anupassi, Anupassana, or whatever it is. So there you are, and then you are an Arahant. Yeah, pretty good. <laughs> Might as well be an Arahant if you can do it. There's no, you know, if the Arahants are as happy as they say, well, then it's, it's really worthwhile. And why hang around in this samsaric existence going around and around in a kind of a pointless thing? Yeah, then you come to the very end of the path. And that is why the Buddha says here towards the very end, the mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated in this way, in this way, important, right, is very fruitful and beneficial. And um, then just to summarize it here a little bit, it comes towards the very end here. How is mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated so as to fulfill the four kinds of mindfulness meditation? And then the Buddha just says, well, when you do the breath meditation, then you are doing body contemplation. Why? Because the body and the breath is an aspect of the body. That is why that is the case. So again, just underline this idea that the breath meditation is an aspect of kaya vipassana, body contemplation. So uh, there you are. That is the uh, promise of the Buddha. Now, the promise is that if you practice the anapanasati all the way to its completion, this is what the result is. The result is uh, the ending of all suffering in the world, the highest happiness that is uh, achievable for a human being, the ending of the defilements, uh, insight into the nature of reality so you can make good choices in your life, uh, yeah, the, uh, the freeing from all these obstructions and problems in the world. Uh, it's just, you know, why? This, this is it, right? It's obvious. You find the highest meaning of existence. You, you let go of all the nonsense in the world. Uh, and uh, so why not do this? Uh, there's every good reason to do it. And the alternative, of course, is carry on in samsara and suffer and having problems and all of these kind of things. Uh, this is obviously what everyone should be doing with their lives, uh, whether they <laughs> whether they understand it or not, I was going to say. But uh, this is obviously the solution to the problem. If the Buddha is right about this, wow, it is a beautiful solution to the problem of life. Uh, so uh, just for the last few minutes, what do we do now? This is so uplifting, but it's also very high dharma. Yeah, these are things that are so profound in many ways, and many of you will say, oh, this is still far away, perhaps. Uh, but uh, don't think about whether it's far away or not. That's really not really relevant. Uh, the only thing that is relevant is whether you are making progress. Uh, if you are making progress, if you are heading in the right direction, then one day, you will have these kind of results, whether you want to or not, and I guarantee you that you want to. So you are, you just have to look at whether you're making progress. If you're not making progress, then you have a problem, yeah, because then, of course, you're not heading, you're never going to get there. But as long as you're making progress, you will get there one day. Yeah? So um, what should we focus on in our daily lives? And uh, you know the answer to that already because it is so obvious what the answer is. Yeah? The answer is not that you should focus on your breath at all times. Some people, sometimes you hear this kind of teachings, but I fundamentally disagree with that. The, what we should focus on is what gives rise to the potential for good meditation in the future. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have seen throughout again and again that the thing which gives rise to good meditation in the future is always sila, it's always morality, it's the kindness of the heart, it's the goodness of your character. You have to develop your entire character, your entire personality in the direction of goodness and kindness. And if your entire character is gradually uh, 
changing, gradually uh, em you know, emerging into this kind of greater sphere of kindness, whatever you want to call it, it's kind of gradually leading in that direction. This is happening over time. Uh, then guaranteed that your medication will be approved over time as well. Uh, so that is where our effort should be. Uh, so instead of just being mindful in daily life, uh, be mindful with a purpose. Uh, the purpose of mindfulness should be to uh, observe yourself, to know what you're doing, to understand where your mind is at, even if you can, uh, and then try to use some of the techniques we have been discussing now to keep your mind in the right kind of balance, uh, not to allow yourself to get too upset by the worldly things, uh, learn to look at people in the way, in such a way that you can be at ease with them, you can have compassion for them, even if they are very difficult, uh, yeah? And as you do this over time, gradually, 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 your mind will change it. You'll become a brighter person, a happier person. Your feeling inside will be one of goodness. Yeah? You, you, you will start to appreciate yourself more and all these other things and self-esteem and whatever. All of that will come as a consequence of that. Uh, so that is ultimately where the practice is. Uh, so how can we ensure that we do this practice? Uh, it sounds so easy. All we have to do is remember kindness. Yeah? And you know, I always ask people, oh, can you remember one word? And people say, yeah, I can't remember one word, but you can't. Through these teachings, remind yourself of what they are about. Remind yourself of why they matter in your life. Remind yourself of some of the techniques to overcome the defilements of the mind and how to look at the world in a different way. And as you keep on coming back to these teachings, as you keep on allowing yourself to be brainwashed by the beautiful washing powder of the Buddha, the Dhamma cleans you out, yeah, and takes the mind directed in the right way. Let's not call it brainwash, let's call it conditioning of the Buddha. It is a conditioning that only leads to happiness. So that is what you have to allow to happen gradually, gradually, gradually. Investigate these teachings, reflect on them. And as you do that, after a while, the idea of kindness becomes more second nature. Don't have to think about it so much anymore. It's almost as it becomes a part of who you are as a person. You are kind of moving around this big super tanker of habits. Habits used to be moving in one direction, and you had maybe many yeah, prob problems in the mind that were kind of doing the wrong thing or defilements or whatever. And gradually, this mass, this momentum of this enormous shift of habits is kind of gradually moving around more and more and more as you gradually recondition the mind. And one day, the mind is showing, pointing in the exact opposite direction. You have reconditioned the mind, and then the momentum is towards positive states of mind instead of negative ones. It is not as if you can no longer avoid to do the right thing. Kindness is embedded deep inside. You come back to the meditation retreat, you sit down, and all of these things that the Buddha is promising, they just happen. That doesn't matter, of course, because the foundation is so powerful. And then you will go to the Buddha, you bow down to the Buddha, and you will cry tears of joy because you understand the power of these teachings. So that is what I wish you all. <laughs> and I hope you have lots of success on this marvelous Buddhist path. And I wish you all the very, very best in your practice. And uh, I'm going to stop there because now we're going to um, wrap up a little bit. And I'm going to invite Venerable Chanda and Mel and whoever it is who's supposed to. Uh, do this last thing. Should I talk a little bit first? How are you envisaging this last part? Do you have any? Yeah, you're welcome to say something if you wish, Ajahn. Yeah. Otherwise, I can. Okay. Yeah. Let me, let me start now, and then, and then you can talk about things afterwards. Yeah. And um, first of all, I would just like to, uh, maybe we can do this now. I will thank you. It's been marvelous to be with everyone, and I really appreciate that Bhutanda has really hard work over the England, not just organizing the people, but also being kind of a co teacher. What a marvelous thing that is, uh, because uh, sometimes it's nice to have co teachers. Uh, 
and uh, you kind of get a slightly different feel for the Dhamma when that happens. So thank you so much for, for doing that. Thing. And uh, I would just like to uh, remind you all of uh, what a, a wonderful thing it is and that uh, is happening in, in England. Yeah, with the Tantra starting a monastery over there, hasn't really got off the quite off the ground yet. It's kind of you know hovering somewhere, trying to get on the ground. And, and uh, but it is a very uh, very important thing for Dhamma to really set root properly in the various countries around the world. Like we have monastery there, we have monastics in the lay community kind of coming together in this way. And, and what a marvelous thing that is. And especially it is really important in our world to give good facilities, not just for the male Sangha, but also the female Sangha. It is still the case that it is far easier to be a monk in this world than it is to be a nun. And it shouldn't really be like that. We should have a, a, a sense of gender equity where men and women have the same opportunities to become monastics. And because it's such a wonderful path that it is terrible if we kind of keep half of humanity out of this beautiful path. So we need those facilities and we need the abilities for women also to have these opportunities on the path. And every one of you, if you ever want to become a bhikkhuni, and we can go to the Bhutanda and we can say, please, I want to be a bhikkhuni. Yeah? And then we have that opportunity. It's so important that we have that opportunity in the world. But uh, Remember, if you support Venerable Chanda over there in England, and I would really, um, I would really, you know, encourage you to do that to the best of your ability. And remember that it's not just Venerable Chanda that you are supporting, and you're supporting something far larger than that. And this is one of the things since I went down when I was talking about the and generosity before is that when we when you give her. To the Buddhist cause, what you're giving to this large movement across the world. It's like when someone comes here to the Maloka Center in Perth, yeah, and uh, it's a help. But always keep in mind that these talks that are given down here by someone like Andrew Brown was out to millions of people, yeah. This Sangha, the whole Buddhist movement, is there to create happiness in the world and to reduce suffering. That is its whole purpose. Exactly what is happening. So when you're supporting um, Buddhist institutions, Buddhist communities, what you are supporting is this reduction of suffering in the world and the improvement in people's well-being on a very, very large scale. And by contributing to that, you have a part in that. Yeah, it is part of it. You are a contributor to the happiness of the whole world, not the whole world, but a large part of the world. What a wonderful thing that is. And when you think about it like that, it actually is much more than just uh, supporting a particular person or supporting a particular monastery. Man. It's about this grand vision man, of, the, of the, you know, something very important and powerful happening in the world. In fact, the only thing perhaps ultimately really worthwhile happening, man. the only place where there is true meaning, the only place where there's a real goal and purpose, man. that is what you're supporting. Man. So what a wonderful thing that is. So think about these things in the right way. And when you think about these things in the right way, the whole thing becomes more powerful, more beautiful, both in your own practice, but also in how you spread it out into the world to other people. Anyway, I, I spoke in enough now because I've been speaking for all of these days. So, Venerable Chanda, your, your turn. For, uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. I might actually ask Mel to say a few words first, because she can also say something about how you can support what we're doing. And then I'll end by basically expressing my gratitude, saying a little bit more about the project and thanking Ajahn Pramali. So. Wonderful. Thank you, Venerable Chanda, um, for inviting me to speak. And, and thank you, Ajahn Pramali, for giving us so much of your time um, the last eight days. Um, it's been so wonderful to hear the Dharma from, from you. It's just been so, given so much clarity and hearing so much detail on the suttas. I know that I'm not alone in feeling that I have a greater understanding of the, the Buddha's teachings now than I did before the start of the week. Um, and as you mentioned, we're really blessed that we have not just one, but two gifted teachers um, with us this week. And it's just been such a privilege um, so thank you very much, uh, Arjun Brahmali, for your time and generosity, 
for coming and sharing um, your teachings with us and Venerable Chandra for your wonderful evening Dharma talks and meditations that have been so nourishing and restorative and um, yeah, so, so to you both. And I think I speak on behalf of everyone. There's been so many beautiful comments already. I think that you know how much we value what we've received this week. Um, and to the community, I think I'd just like to offer a few words, if I may, on the Buddhist practice of generosity, although I'm conscious that Arjun Pramali is a bit of a hard act to follow, um, but I'll try. Um, and um, obviously the, the Buddha, he teaches that the dana is a very important part of our spiritual path, serving as a foundation of our practice. And practicing generosity really helps us to gladden our minds. And it supports non-attachment and eliminates ill will. And as we've just heard, it serves the whole world. I mean, what a beautiful practice. Um, Buddhist monastics obviously practice their generosity by sharing the Dharma with us. So for us as a lay community, we can show how we really value this by offering and practicing generosity back. And, and that can take many forms. We can practice generosity of thought and generosity of our time and our material goods. But today, my request is that we are generous with our pockets with our finance, financial giving, because we're still about half a million pounds short of being able to purchase the first Bikuni Monastery in the UK, which is the wider aim of our project. Sounds like a very large amount, but little by little, uh, pound by pound, I think we will get there. So just as a little guideline, it may be helpful to think of how much an in-person eight-day retreat such as this might have cost us. And perhaps if any of you are able to contribute generously with that in mind, it would be very much appreciated and deeply appreciated, I know. So many, many thanks to you both once again. And now I pass back to um, Venerable Chanda to tell us more about the exciting plans for the future on uh, Anitampa. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. And yeah, first, I just want to express my own gratitude, first of all, to the team that I have behind me, because it wasn't only me organising this, it was actually a lot, lot smoother and easier than it has been previously when we started this project. So I have four wonderful co-hosts, Renny and Mel and Derek and Leonie, who've been keeping this space really safe um, and answer, you know, helping with the questions and making sure that any important messages are relayed between us. And that is so helpful and so um, reassuring for me to enable me to, you know, be able to teach the community. And obviously, it's been a total privilege to be able to do that with Ajahn Pramali. Um, at first, I thought, gosh, how can I, you know, even consider that I'll be teaching along with one of my own teachers. But it's really wonderful to feel so encouraged by, you know, senior monastics who I feel are my Kalyanamitas on the path. It's uh, incredibly inspiring and it really helps me also to delve deeper into the Dhamma for myself. So a huge thanks to the co-hosts. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the people that we're not aware of. One of them's here actually, Paul has been very busy um, uploading all the talks to our YouTube channel and of course we've been live streaming as well. And there are also other people like Karen and Annie at Bookings who've been helping this whole process. And of course, my most heartfelt and deep thanks to Ajahn Brahmali again for your years of practice and love for the suttas, love for the Dhamma, um, and just the clarity and beauty with which you express the teachings, not only um, through your gift with communication, but also just by devoting your whole life to that. And I think that really comes across. Many people have said it's just a privilege to be in the presence of people who are so kind, teachers who are so kind, and you can feel, you know, that they're really living what they're practicing. Um, not only, as you say, on the meditation cushion, but also in their lives. So it's incredibly inspiring for me. And, um, you know, it's interesting sometimes when you're in the middle of teaching these retreats. Um, for me personally, I'm just kind of hoping it's all going well and that everything's going to plan. And, you know, I'm sort of very focused on what I want to share and, you know, the teachings that I'm receiving. And it takes up until sort of the day six or seven to start thinking, whoa, something quite incredible is actually happening here. So I also really want to thank everybody who's been part of that co-creation, everybody's practice, you know, which I think I can sense has been deepening throughout this journey. And also the beautiful kind messages of encouragement, of appreciation that we receive, because it's really it's not so much a gift for us that we receive those kind of 
that we receive any kind of praise. It's more just a gift knowing that people are able to establish themselves in the Dhamma and that there's so much goodness there in the world. So it's one of the privileges of being a monastic, just to keep on being in contact with the goodness of so many people who are sincerely committed to this path. So a huge thanks to all the volunteers, Ajahn Brahmali, and of course, all the participants. And we've all been on this journey together. It's not ended yet. So we're going to have a little bit more time together. Um, but I just wanted to also encourage um, generosity through feeling part of this community, through being part of this community. And hopefully, as we continue being increasingly involved, because this is not for me, I would never do a project of such um, magnitude maybe, but also difficulty um, if it was just for myself, because it's, it's really hard work. And I do miss having the solitude and the simple life that I went forth for the sake of. Um, sometimes it's really conflicting actually in my mind, but what spurs me on is knowing that this is for the, um, for the benefit of so many people that I may never even meet, you know, for people in the future as well as people in the present day, because there aren't enough places for women to practice. And it's important to say that this is not only for nuns, this is not only for women. Any monastic community offers a kind of sanctuary for the world. You know, every person from any um, religious or racial or um, gender background, you know, people from marginalized communities are all welcome to be part of this and to come and practice in a monastic setting. And I think a monastic setting has a very different quality to a retreat center, which is focused on the meditation. Because in a monastic setting, you have the opportunity to practice all aspects of the Eightfold Path. You know, you have time for solitude and sitting practice supported by spiritual friends, but you also have the opportunity to serve and to give to the community and be part of, you know, seeing something develop for others. And so there's an immense feeling of satisfaction from that, which really can give the practice a lot of juice um, and expand your own practice from something you do for yourself to something that you do as a gift for the world. So slowly we will get towards our aim. I have no doubt about that. And of course we have Ajahn Brown behind us as spiritual advisor, and he's also at the moment, our chair, actually, on the trust. He used to be um, a regular trustee, now he's the chair, which is very nice. Uh, so he's completely committed to this, and neither him nor I are going to give up part way. So this is really something that, you know, hopefully will develop a strong feeling of spiritual friendship, which I think is lacking for many people in their lives. So I do really look forward to inviting you eventually to be part of that. And in the meantime, you know, if you do want to volunteer, I think Mel could maybe add the links, no, the, both the donation links and also uh, maybe the TMAT email address, whereby you can contact us if you feel you'd like to be involved in some way. And of course, when the COVID um, pandemic starts to hopefully subside, there'll be opportunities to meet in person again and to come and stay for some time wherever I'm currently dwelling. So, so I think that's plenty for me. And uh, we have another 10 minutes. So perhaps if anyone would like to ask any questions around that or say any last words to Ajahn Pumali on anything, um, we could do that. So if you want to, you could just send messages to me or send messages, I guess to me, that's easiest. Otherwise I'll ask Ajahn Brahmali to say a few more words. So messages are coming. Yeah, please do feel free to just express your gratitude and I'll read it out. It's very uplifting. Thanks for a much needed retreat and the opportunity to immerse in the profound Dhamma teachings and meditation practice for eight days. Ajahn Brahmali and Ven Chanda, you are both amazing Dhamma teachers with much inspiration and clarity. Heartfelt thanks and merit to the team of organizers too. Blessings of the Triple Gem to you all. And thank you to Matthias for facilitating the 
meditation afternoons. Really felt special having that safe space to meditate with everyone. Yeah, thanks a lot, Matthias. Do you have a list of volunteer roles for the Anukampa project? Not exactly a list. It's kind of things sort of become clear as we go on. Um, and one of the difficulties at the moment for me is that I'm the person managing the volunteers and sometimes bringing in new volunteers who only have a little bit of time actually makes a lot more work. So sometimes it's just beyond my capacity to actually bring in more people. But I think one of the long-term roles that will open up over time is to have a volunteer manager. So we will be looking for people with quite a bit of time. Um, but things do come up along the way, for example, helping out with co-hosting or helping out with uploading things to the YouTube channel, um, sometimes opportunities to offer food or offer in other ways. Um, and we usually put those in our newsletter. So we have a newsletter that goes out usually every one or two months, which you can sign up for at our um, website. It's the same link. Mel's put the events link up. There's also a donations link and a homepage link, but it's the same website basically. And you can sign up for our letter and find out a bit more there. But if you do want to write in and ask um, about volunteering, it's helpful for us if you can say how much time you have available, and if you have any specific skills or inclinations of the ways in which you might like to serve, that's, that can be helpful as well. Uh, someone else says, thank you for your awesome teachings. You make the Dharma truly alive for me. I'm entranced. <laughs> Many thanks Ajahn Brahmali and Venchanda and co-hosts for the retreat. At the risk of sounding dramatic, the retreat for me is like a lifeline during this difficult time. Oh. Yeah, I do believe the Dhamma is a lifeline. Thank you, dear Venerables, for such a life-changing teachings and guidance. It means more than you'll ever know. May the merits from these precious teachings be shared with you both. Much metta and gratitude. <laughs> this is nice, isn't it, Ajahn Brahmali? Great. So, oh, one more. Okay, whoa, a few more. I'll read a couple more out and then um, I think we'll have to let Ajahn Pramali go eventually. So I'll hand over to you again after a couple more comments. Thank you, Ajahn Pramali. I feel blessed to have benefited from your lifetime of practice and scholarship, the combination of which has had a profound effect on my views and understanding. This retreat has been deeply inspirational and a much appreciated nudge in the right direction. Thank you for a beautiful retreat to the awesome threesome, Ajahn Brahm, Brahmali and Ben Chanda. Thank you also to the beautiful supporters too. The retreat has inspired me to develop wholesome qualities. I feel shy to read out one to me, but. Thank you, Ven Chanda and Ajahn Brahmali for all the and all the team for bringing us this teaching. Okay, one more, which I'll have to get over. Thank you so much for bringing us this retreat and for all your wise words, meditations and wonderful humor, which has had me laughing out loud. So much for a silent retreat. I feel nourished and blessed. Thank you so much to you and the retreat volunteers and all the work you're doing to bring us Anu Kampa. Awesome. And as I say, thanks to everybody, because you're all very much part of Anukampa. It wouldn't be anything without everyone here. So thank you very much. <laughs> so Ajahn Pramali, would you like to say a few yeah. words of, to end? Hi. I think anything more is required. It's wonderful to hear all the good feedback. It's always nice when you're teaching to hear that people enjoy the teaching. Yes, I'm sure you feel the same, Venerable Chanda marvelous to hear that because uh, that's the point of teaching is to kind of transmit some dharma so it's wonderful what wonderful to get my speech again and uh, again i would like also like to just finish off by thanking Mr. Bachanda and all the all their helpers and everyone for making this possible and to every one of you for being part of this uh, because it wouldn't be the same one here yeah it's kind of helps to have a few people <laughs> coming in so it's marvelous to meet you all again 
and uh, I wish you all the very best. Uh, look after each other, look after yourself, and, and you, you know what to do now, just have to put it into practice. Uh, and we may meet again. Yeah, are you still have, planning to have a retreat up in uh, the mid, no, what is it, what is it, the Midlands? Or what, what is it? Yeah, there? you're right, That's actually. It. I always thought I was a northerner, but apparently I'm a Midlander. <laughs> Apparently, it is the East Midlands, I think, Derbyshire. So, uh, yes, I'm very much hoping that we can invite you again, Ajahn Pramali, to come and do an in person retreat, hopefully in Derbyshire because it's very beautiful and that's where I'm from. And I think even my parents would like to uh, have the opportunity again to host you. I think it's amazing for my own family to see other monastics and to get closer to the Dhamma in that way. And uh, I know quite a few people who are here now were on that retreat and uh, they appreciated the setting and the beauty of the place. So we'll try our best. Uh, things keep changing <laughs> with the uh, availability of the venues and also the COVID obviously. So, but I'm sure it will happen and we'll aim for um, 2023. So no promises yet. And I may be asking for volunteers to organize it. Um, so we will see what happens. But certainly you always have a very open invitation, Ajahn Bamali. And um, it's, it's, you know, I can't express my gratitude deeply enough that you'd be willing to come all that way from Perth, you know, to help us here. Because I know it's your love for the Dhamma, but it's also to support this project. Um, it's also your love for monastic life and your um, strong dedication to gender equity in the Sangha. It's very inspiring and it's not as common as you would think. So we're very blessed. Thank you. Okay, bye, bye everyone. Take care. Take care, uh, Ajahn Bramali. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great. Oh, I feel quite moved. So, <laughs> so we're going to have a, oh, we've got a little bit of time. Would you like to come back in half an hour or even 15 minutes? What do you think? Hmm, that's a tricky one. So, okay, now I've asked a question. Can you stop recording on live? Uh, so now I have to have a show of hands because I've asked.